Okay, so let's get specific. We're gonna go into the nutrition portion. Um, so your grocery list. So let's talk about food. Uh, so the way this works is I've broken it up into three different categories. The first category is protein, the second category is fruits and vegetables, and on the next slide, the third category is complex carbs. So here's a list of, all, of your proteins of what you should be eating. Um, I do have a, a free grocery list on my website, so if you miss any of this, or it's kind of hard to take a lot of notes, um, it's also on my website, and I'm, I'm gonna be putting these, uh, I'm taping this right now, so it'll all be free on my website. You can watch it on YouTube. So if any of you miss any of this, you can always go back and uh, either go to YouTube or go to my website and you can just watch it again. Or I'm having another lecture on the 16th. You can come to that. Um, okay, so protein. What to eat for protein? Eggs, lean beef, fish, seafood, chicken breast, turkey breast, protein shakes. Pea protein by Olympic Labs. Uh, you can get that from iherb.com. Pork, turkey slices, lamb, and buffalo. The second category is fruits or vegetables. Fruits or vegetables, pretty much anything you want. Uh, these are, this is for above ground vegetables. Then the third category, complex carbs, brown rice, oatmeal, beans, brown rice bread, or Ezekiel bread, sweet potatoes, yams, yucca, and squash. Um, now, I try to get my clients, if they are gonna eat complex carbs, to eat more sweet potatoes, yams, yucca, and squash. And the reason why, it's because there's certain anti-nutrients in grains, whether it's brown rice or oatmeal or beans. Um, you know, so those can be the different types of proteins called phytates, lectin, lectins, and gluten, which can actually damage the lining of the gut. So when clients are eating uh, complex carbs, I have them really lean towards the sweet potatoes, yucca, and squash. Um, so let me, that kind of leads me to this quote over here. The scope of the problem is much greater than imagined, even a decade ago. A list of more than 150 diseases and symptoms associated with sensitivity to gluten and other grain proteins. And that's from the book Dangerous Grains by Dr. James Braley and Ron Hogan. So many, you guys might not know what gluten is. It's basically a protein that's really hard to digest and it, it damages the lining of the gut. So what has gluten? Uh, wheat bread has gluten, barley has gluten, millet has gluten. Even quinoa is not that good for you. There's a anti-nutrient called sopines, I think it's pronounced, sopanes. Um, so the point is sweet potatoes, yucca, and squash have less of a damaging effect to the gut. Um, so I, I try to get clients to focus on those complex carbs. Are yams and sweet potatoes the same? Or are sweet potatoes more carbs? Um, as far as the carb content, they're pretty close to being the same. The nutrient density, as far as micronutrients, they're a little bit different. Um, and they taste a little bit different too. So I have clients eat both and they can just interchange one for the other. Uh, let's see. So for, for greater improvements, avoid gluten, alcohol, dairy, except some plain organic yogurt and soy. If you're trying to lose body fat, Yogurt or any dairy is not that great because it has a high insulinogenic effect. All that means is that when insulin is high, it's much likely, likelier that your body's gonna store body fat. So what I do with clients that are looking to lose body fat is I'll have them eat yogurt right after a workout. Um, and you know, if, if, they, if they really wanna lose fat, then have them cut out all dairy completely. Uh, fats, the ones that I like, the three that, that most of my clients will be eating is coconut oil. It's great for fat loss. It's also antibacterial, antiviral. Uh, you can cook with coconut oil. Fish oil is phenomenal. Uh, Carlson's fish oil from iherb.com is pretty inexpensive. Um, so half a teaspoon to a tablespoon for women and uh, one and one and a half tablespoons for men. Fish oil is phenomenal. It's good for the brain. It's good for your skin. It's, it's a natural anti-inflammatory. Uh, one of the comp components of fish oil is a DHA, which is a, a which 60% of your brain is composed of DHA. So it's, it's definitely brain food. Um, and if you have uh, any type of inflammation in your body, fish oil is really important for that. Carrie's Gold Butter, butter you can get that at Trader Joe's. It has a lot of vitamin K. Uh, it's it's grass-fed butter. So it's, it tastes phenomenal and you can cook with it. Okay, so how, did all, how does all this work? Um, pretty basic. So this is your plate divided into three sections. What I have clients do is uh, the fist rule for meals. So protein, complex carbs, and a fruit or a veggie. And then half a fist, so it'd be half a fist, half a fist. So clients are having three meals and two snacks. So again, it's a fist, a fist, a fist. So a fist of protein, a fist for fruit or a veggie, and a fist for complex carbs. And then the snack is half a fist, 
than half a fist. So it's half a fist of protein, half a fist of fruits or vegetables. Okay? So you can always have a bigger breakfast. A lot of people, they'll, eat, they'll try to lose weight, but yet they, they backload their food. So in other words, they eat these huge dinners and these small, a lot of people skip breakfast. And actually that's the best way to gain body fat. Um, you wanna eat like a king for breakfast, a queen for lunch, and then a pauper for dinner. So your biggest meal should technically be for breakfast. Most people aren't hungry in the morning, I get that, but you should eat anyway. Um, you know, you're gonna burn through that, those calories throughout the day. Um, so a couple exceptions to the fist rule, you can always have a bigger breakfast, you can always have more vegetables. So let's say right here you're doing a snack and you have protein, half a fist, and then let's say for vegetables you do, you're, you're having a salad. The salad you could just double up. I mean, like above ground vegetables like salad you can go to town on. I mean, vegetables are one of the best ways to lose body fat and they're super healthy because they're loaded with fiber and they're loaded with micronutrients. Uh, vegetables are phenomenal. Um, so. If you want to do more above ground veggies, go ahead. Uh, the complex carbs is optional and can be replaced with fat. So um, that kind of leads me to this quote. So in Bill Wolcott's book, Metabolic Typing, he summarizes that due to bioindividuality, fast oxidizer versus slow oxidizer, or parasympathetic versus sympathetic, some clients need more fat and protein, while others do better with a little more carbs. So what I have on here, this is a, a sample meal plan. You'll see that the complex carbs is optional. And you'll see it here again, it's optional. And then for dinner, it's optional. That's because some people, they just do really well on a high fat, high protein diet. And then some might need a little more complex carbs to where their complex carbs are like 40% of their diet. And I let clients kind of figure that out. Also, I, I look at their food journals every week and they give me some feedback as far as their energy levels and having a little more carbs or a little less and how they feel. So here's a sample. So in this person, you know, they had two to three organic eggs uh, or egg whites, one to two yolks, half a sweet potato and some blueberries. So back to, to this slide, everything's gonna be come back to this model and this model. So the meals are always gonna be like this, three sections, and the snacks are gonna be like this, two sections. So we'll go back again. Um, so the protein is the eggs, the sweet potato is the complex carbs, and the blueberries is the fruit. fruit. Now this is a snack for 9.30, so there's only two categories. You got your protein here at the turkey, and then you got your salad for your veggie. And then now we're going to a lunch, which is a meal. So there's three categories. Your protein's your chicken, vegetables, asparagus, and then you got your yam. Uh, back to a snack, tuna is your protein, and then your vegetable. Yeah, actually, this, per this person had both fruit and a vegetable, which is fine. Uh, so there's only two categories. Back to the three categories, protein, complex carbs, the squash, and then the small salads, your veggie, and then back to the two categories, chicken soup with vegetables, okay? So this person ate six times, you could do five or six meals a day. It helps with fat loss, it helps with regulating your blood sugar, um, it helps with gaining muscle and losing fat. There's a lot of reasons why eating five to six times a day makes sense. Cook with Kerry's gold butter or coconut oil. Uh, if you eat less complex carbs, then add a little more fat to your meals. So if you're a type of person that does better high protein, high fat, and much lower uh, carbs, then what you could do just to make up the calories, just add a little more butter and coconut oil to your, to your meals. Make sure everything is organic. That's really important. Um, Actually, I'll cover that in a second. Don't drink water during the meals. Um, people that eat too fast have a tendency to push down their meals with water. Big mistake. Um, what ends up happening is you water down the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, so it actually reduces um, your ability to, to absorb nutrients. So don't drink water when you eat. You only wanna drink water 20 minutes before or one hour after. So that's really important because most people have some type of digestive issue, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, eat every two, two to three hours, even if you're not hungry. So if you're waiting till you get hungry, that could be hour number four, hour number five, and that's when people cave and eat massive amounts of carbs. And the body does that for a reason, because your blood sugar is so low, you crave sugar and potato chips. That's another reason why eating two to three hours a day, it's so easy to control carb cravings. Most people that are trying to lose fat, the number one thing I hear all the time is, I can't understand why I crave carbs. And whether it's sugar or salty carbs, like potato chips or processed food, part of it has to do with blood sugar. So. Also for recipes, if you're into recipes, the Paleo Diet cookbooks, there's a bunch of them on Amazon. They're really, really good. 
Um, okay. Important points, foods to stay away from, fruit juice, sugar, candy, popcorn, chips, processed rice, white bread, pasta, chocolate, any other foods that are processed. If it's in a bag, do not eat it. If it has an ingredient that you cannot pronounce, do not eat it. Most of those ingredients are just loaded with chemicals. Um, so you really want to buy food. I mean, our genes haven't changed in the last 100,000 years. We still have hunter and gatherer genes. So you're either eating food that you can pull out of the ground or pluck from a tree, or you can shoot it with a bow and arrow. So that's the study of, uh, that's kind of this whole paleo movement that you see right now. It's the combination of evolution, biology, and nutrition. And it's understanding uh, nutrition from the perspective of genes and that we haven't changed at all in the last hundred thousand years or very little so doing these high carb 80 percent high carb diet it goes against the grain or at least goes against our genetic code yeah there you go I'm pun intended I mean, wow um, so yeah so you really want to avoid um, these high carb diets actually with cows the best way to fatten up a cow is to feed it tons of grains that's how you fatten up cows. And it's the same thing with humans. If you want to fatten someone up, you feed them like an 80% carb diet, tons of grains, and they get nice and fat. So um, buy a tape measure, scale, food journal. So with my clients, I have them do weigh-ins like two, three times a week, some of them every day. Um, I know that kind of sounds compulsive, but the, the, the tape measure and scale is great. They have them do it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, and then they do their waist measurement around the belly button. A lot of it's just to keep people aware because, you know, I'm sure all you guys are really busy. It's easy to get sucked in into your life and forget what you're trying to accomplish with your body. And what ends up happening is this whole process, you just deprioritize it. But if you weigh in every morning, it's kind of a reminder. The only thing with certain clients, I have to make sure that they don't have an emotional reaction and that they understand that the tape measure and the scale, it's just a data point. It's just information to, to see if you're on track. So a lot of times a client will bring in their measurements and for some reason, if they've plateaued, that's when I look at their food journal and see what I have to change. The other recommendation I would make or suggestion would be to keep a food journal. All you have to do is write down the time and the meal. It's really simple. There's a huge psychological impact with the food journal. It helps, it helps you maintain accountability and awareness. And in our society, because it's, everyone's so busy, a lot of people become very unself-aware. So I call it kind of the lollipop society. <laughs> it's like, you know, most people have this kind of head and no body. And that's kind of the connection they have. They have zero connection with their body and everything's in their brain. They're processing information, they're driving, they're working. You know, it's all brain activity. And anything below the neck, they're like, I don't even know what's there, you know? So it's, it's starting to integrate the mind and the body. And you know you start to do that when you see what you're eating from a day-to-day -day basis. Like I'll have clients that will say, oh, I'm eating healthy, but I don't understand why I'm gaining weight. That's where the food journal comes in because sometimes they eat out more often than they, they even realize. And they, they just don't have a lot of awareness of what's, what they're putting in their mouth. So eat every two to three hours, control blood sugar, increase energy, easier to lose fat. You should never be hungry on this program. If you are, eat more. That's the th My clients are never hungry. Actually, they get tired of eating. <laughs> They really do, because they're eating all the time, and it's like, Jesus, this sucks. But, you know, it, it, their, their body's fueled, they have a lot of energy, it really changes their life. Um, I, some of these diets that I've seen, these kind of um, crash diets, and people are starving all the time, they're awful. They trash your body, they slow down your metabolic rate via the thyroid. They're just not good for you. Um, okay, so here's a good quote, Dr. Weston Price. Uh, Dr. Weston Price book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. He illustrates and contrasts how the modern Western diet is at the root cause of most diseases and compares the Western diet to indigenous communities around the world. So this guy was a dentist. He wanted to understand why people's teeth were rotting. What he did is he traveled around the world and went to all these indigenous communities in South America and Africa and Australia, and these people didn't brush their teeth. And they had perfect teeth. And he's like, this is so bizarre. And the reason why they had perfect teeth is because they didn't eat our crap. They didn't eat the Western diet. Now what was interesting is that they could have an indigenous community and the same type of indigenous people that moved to the cities had all rotting teeth. So it's the Western diet that, that is at the root cause of disease and really bad teeth. I'm not promoting don't brush your teeth or floss it. I'm just saying that uh, the root cause of really bad teeth has to do with your diet. 
And the Western diet primarily is a lot of sugar, uh, a huge massive amount of carbs, and it, it's just not good for you for a lot of reasons that we'll cover. Cheap meals, so this is a lifestyle, folks. Okay, this is a really important slide. Uh, so one to two cheat meals a week on the same day might have a positive impact on results. A restrictive calorie diet probably slows down metabolic rate via the thyroid. Cheat meals one day a week might combat this effect. So like with my clients, whenever they're doing their measurements, let's say they have pizza the day before and then they have chocolate and almonds or whatever. The next day they do their measurements, it's exactly the same. And then the following day, their waist measurement drops. So there's a physical impact and there's a psychological impact by utilizing a, a cheat meal, one to two cheat meals on the same day. It, it might actually help you lose weight, but it also from a psychological perspective, it helps you maintain consistency because you don't feel like trapped that you're following some restrictive program. So I always like the 90-10 the rule, 90%, you know, eat the right thing, do the right thing, 10%, do whatever you want. And everyone always asks me about alcohol. Uh, alcohol lowers testosterone. It's not good for losing body fat. If you're gonna do alcohol or drink alcohol, uh, the next question is, should, is wine okay? Okay, I'm asking questions in my own head. Um, so alcohol, I would just try to limit it as much as you can. If you really wanna lose more fat, I would try to avoid it because uh, there's just, there's no nutrients in alcohol. Wine is not that great. Um, I wouldn't recommend wine. Uh, a lot of times people will have wine at night and actually it, it, it screws up their sleep. What ends up happening is alcohol, any alcohol acts as a natural diuretic. So it not only drops your blood sugar in the middle of the night, but it might make you want to urinate. Um, so those are two reasons. There are some certain micronutrients in wine that might make it okay, but it, wine is a mixed bag of tricks. Um, so I just have clients, if they really like wine, try to limit it as much as possible. It's not gonna help you with fat loss. Um, one of the things that when people go to Whole Foods, they're like, oh, it's organic, it's organic. Look, if, if, if you buy a product that is in the center aisles at any grocery store, it's probably not good for you. You really need to shop in the periphery. So in the periphery, it's protein, it's, it's you know, sweet potatoes and yams, it's fruits and vegetables. In the aisles, it's all packaged foods. And if you're trying to, to, to get the most out of your body as far as health and wellness and energy, just shop on the periphery. Here's a good uh, quote uh, from Body from Life by Bill Phillips um, and many other bodybuilding books. Carb cycling and cheat meals are common occurrence in the fitness literature. The reason is both for physical and psychological impact. So that kind of goes back to the thyroid and, and why maybe having one or two cheat meals is, is, can be a good thing. Uh, you are what you eat and you are what you eat eats. So you kind of have to think about that for a second. Um, so probably the easiest way to describe what that really means is if you're feeding a cow soy and corn and then you eat the cow meat, the problem with cows eating soy and corn, it actually begins to change the nutrients in their fat and, and within the, the, their muscle cells. So what you really wanna focus on is grass-fed meats, like grass-fed beef or grass-fed lamb or grass-fed buffalo, because it actually changes the micronutrients, whether it's the omega-3, omega-6s, um, it changes a lot of the uh, other matri macro micronutrients like CLA. So, and also, it, the cows get really unhealthy. So, you know, grass-fed protein is extremely important. Uh, you want to put less toxic, unhealthy animals, fruits, and vegetables in your body. So that's why you want to eat organic uh, food only. Organic foods have more nutrients, which is important for fat, fat loss and muscle repair. Also, hormone disruption. So due to all the chemicals in commercially raised foods, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, growth hormones, and antibiotics, it makes it extremely difficult to lose fat and have optimal energy. Because of a massive hormonal disruption affecting the liver, the thyroid, hormonal output, testosterone, growth hormones, etc. So you want to avoid non-organic foods just by USDA uh, certified organic. So two quick things, buy local organic produce. One, because it has more nutrients. So what do you think would have more nutrients? An apple coming all the way from, let's say, Fiji? Or if you eat an apple that is grown here in, in Los Angeles and it's only a day old? Yeah, because it's just going to be more nutrient dense, you know. So the transit time lowers the density of, of nutrient density of any product, um, any food product. So fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, and any fre the fresher the food, um, the better off, better it is for your body. 
Uh, less toxins, so we talked about that. Organic food, it's a different farming practice, and they're gonna use a lot less toxins. Hopefully no toxins, but I think some of them still use some, some chemicals. Uh, so in Dr. Barry Sears book, Omega RX, he discusses the importance of increasing omega-3s and reducing the impact of omega-6s. He goes on to say that the ratio should be two omega-6s for every one omega-3. But the typical American diet has a 20 to 1 ratio. The 20 to 1 ratio is one of several reasons why disease and aging is common. By eating grass-fed protein, such as beef and buffalo, you begin to change this ratio. Okay, so what is omega-3, what is omega-6? Simply put, omega-3s are good for you, omega-6s, not so good. Omega-6s cause inflammation, which inflammation, which he talks a lot about in his, his disease, he believes inflammation is at the root cause of all diseases. Omega-3 is an anti-inflammatory uh, fat. Um, also, the omegas are really important for skin and brain function. What you see in a lot of processed foods, it's loaded with omega-6s. Or what's also loaded with omega-6s is non-grass-fed proteins. So for instance, if the cow is eating corn and soy, uh, then that cow's gonna be loaded with omega-6s and that's gonna be very toxic for your body. If it's a grass-fed cow, the ratio is probably be closer to a two to one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. And that's gonna be much healthier for your body. So again, that's what Der Barry Sears talks about and a lot of uh, other books have been written on the subject of uh, omega-3, omega-6s, that you wanna keep omega-6s down by eating grass-fed proteins and staying away from processed food. I have a question. Yep. So do you recommend to lower the intake of poultry because of the hormonal intake that you put on them? Uh, yes, but it depends on what your choices are. So, so the question is to lower your, your, in, your intake of chicken yeah. based on where the chicken is, is raised or what kind of toxins are used. Um, if there are you know, pasture-raised chickens that are, that are organic chickens, so what I would recommend, and even Trader Joe's has this, is to buy chickens that are organic and pasture-raised. It's hard to find, Whole Foods has it. Trader Joe's at least has organic. Um, oh, it has it too. oh, does it? Okay, yeah. So it's getting better. Like five years ago, it was, it was a huge problem. Um, because really what was happening is that, you know, five years ago, most foods were pretty toxic. And I think, as you guys have, have an interest in this type of information, you guys as a consumer begin to drive and, and change the production chain or supply chain. Mm -hmm. So by demanding a specific type of product, like if you go to a grocery store and ask them and they don't have it, it'll go up the chain. Or if you say something on your website, like I want more organic uh, uh, grass-fed meats. Like Trader Joe's just changed. I, they, now they have grass-fed beef. They never had that. That just changed over the last year. So the, there's a huge pushback by consumers that people are tired of just crappy food, industrialized food. And the reason why I got that way is because primarily, just through, through the supply chain, they wanted to mass produce more chickens and more eggs and more beef. So the way to do that is actually, if you feed a cow soy and corn, which they're not supposed to eat, you actually can fatten them up. And by doing that, you can sell that cow, they sell it by the pounds, so you actually can make more money. So through the profits and incentive, you really wanna, as a, you know, if I'm an owner of, of I don't know, Farm X, and I really wanna make more money, I would start doing the wrong thing. There's almost a moral hazard problem where they're incentivized to feed these cows corn and soy. But if you go to really good farms, they don't do that. They'll feed them grass and they'll do this whole crop rotation thing and it's a whole different farming practice. Um, so profits, that's why I talked about in the beginning, the whole spiritual thing, how there is a disconnect between profitability and social responsibility where there's an emphasis on profitability because the company only cares about shareholder value and what ends up happening is they just screw over the public and the public doesn't know until they're educated which is part of the reason why I like doing this stuff so that people begin to push back and say hey that's not okay yeah um, so important tips, drink half your body weight in water in ounces. So 200 pound man would drink 100 ounces of water per day. Uh, don't drink water with meals 20 minutes before or one hour after. We talked about that because it waters down in the hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Digestion starts in the mouth, chew your food, 20 to 30 chews per bite. 
Most people eat so fast. They eat while they dry, they eat. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy, but the problem is it actually does affect your health. You really wanna have a 15 to 20 minute experience when you're eating and just chill out. Like old school 1950s, people would sit around the dinner table and talk and eat. That's like the way it's supposed to be. Nobody does that anymore. And I kind of think when I was growing up, we kind of did it a little bit, but we moved out of that stage. And I don't know why, it's a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing, but they had it right back then. Everyone would kind of, you know, they would chill out and eat and talk, and it was like a, an experience. And we don't do that anymore.